Paul, tell us, uh, tell us how this instrument is constructed. Okay. Well, there is, in this case, this instrument's made with uh, probably four varieties of wood. One being the ebony that's used for the fingerboard and the pegs and the tailpiece and the chin rest. Those are called a set of trimmings. Uh, then there is the spruce that is used for the top. There is the maple, which is a sugar maple, likely, that's used in the back and the ribs and the scroll. And then on the inside, you have a base bar that supports the strings that is made out of spruce. You have a sound post which connects the top to the back, which is usually made out of spruce. And then you have the linings that support, that give you a glue edge to support the top and glue it all together, which are probably some a different material. Let me just double check. We use willow. This one also looks like willow, which gives us our fourth variety of wood. And then the bridge, which is also made out of maple, but not curly, like this is, this has curls or tiger stripes, if you will. Uh, but the wood of a bridge is very plain and cut directly on the quarter grain, meaning that it's cut from the center of the tree out to the edge. Uh, the back is cut on the slab, which means that it is cut across the grain, not from the center. As if you were to slice slices off of a tree, that is slab cut. Quarter cut means you're cutting like firewood, you're splitting it from the center out. So bridges are made with quarter cut wood. Backs often are made with quarter cut wood. This is an example of slab cut. Uh, and then there's also an end pin. An end pin is what is a hole drilled through a block which which supports this all the string tension. It's attached with a, a what used to be cat gut, which is now a piece of nylon, and that transmits and is supported by the nut, which is then strung with pegs which turn in a clockwise rotation. And that is a taper fit into the scrolls. So there's nothing gluing that, so that just turns. Usually a little better than that, but it turns. <laughs> well, we have to explain that this, uh, this violin has not been seen, seen the light of day for several years in its case, but uh, mm -hmm. no, it's... Uh, it was uh, renovated about eight years ago, and um, you, you mentioned a couple of, of, of things to, that you saw in this. You talked about uh, the bridge at the top, I believe, um, oh, being yes, the, missized. This curve, or what we call a bridge arch, is too flat, and it's it's slanted like this. It's almost like I should turn the bridge around because it should be slanted toward this, and that's because as you hold it, your bow arm is on the right, and you need to come down. If you have it slanted this way, it brings your elbow way up in the air. It makes it very uncomfortable to play. So uh, the bridge arch is not correct uh, for, uh, for what I do. You also mentioned something on this end, up at this end, um, the... The nut itself yeah, the is, nut. is quite wide. That's, that should be five millimeters from one end. This is about six, I'd say 6.2. I'll measure it now. <laughs> 6.2 millimeters, that is. Let's see how close it is. 6.2. <laughs> Comes from making all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you get a detailed eye. Wow. The tailpiece is a little long. Uh, there should be more distance between the bridge and the tailpiece. That allows an instrument to ring more. So, so all of these improvements would improve it as an instrument to play, and to, I mean, you, it would be playable. This is probably not playable in its current condition, or it'd be it wouldn't difficult. Take, it wouldn't take much. Yeah. I, I would question the size of the neck, maybe, for a child. I'd, I'd like to work with the child and see if this is comfortable, but it's a little big. Big? Yeah, 
it's a little high, I should say. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I'd like to see how their hands mm -hmm. work that. Maybe I would suggest carving that out a little bit. This is a amateur work. This is or something very early in mm -hmm. someone's career. Mm -hmm. Meaning that he never made a lot of instruments like this. And but he was just interested in making something and that's why I I've, I've never heard of the name. It's made in Maine. And uh, I still can't pronounce it. Genoa. JP no Genoa is the maker. 1907, so it's 100 and uh, it's 110 years old. This it's 110 one. years old, and it has survived quite well. Mm -hmm. I would call this in very good condition. Mm -hmm. It's not. There are a couple of cracks, but for instance, uh, Antonio Stradivari instruments, which are made uh, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, uh, the average Strad has 30 cracks. Um, in our instruments. The average Becker probably has four or five cracks. So they get damaged as they get used. Mm -hmm. This one, I only see four or five cracks. So it's, in, it's not in bad condition. Or it wasn't used much over right. its lifetime. It wasn't perhaps. used much, yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's a per perfectly legitimate, small size beginner's instrument. Mm -hmm. And it could probably could sound good. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for that.